Millions of frontline workers keep our economy running and are provided with the latest technology to do their jobs. But digital adoption, especially by frontline workers, is really hard. This is Frontline Innovators. We explore how to overcome challenges and achieve success when we empower our essential workers. I'm Justin Lake. And I'm Gene Signorini. Together, we speak with experts who are leading the way and driving digital transformation to the front line. This podcast is sponsored by Skillful on a mission to help frontline workers learn and use the technology needed to succeed in their jobs. I'm your host, Justin Lake, and we have another excellent episode ahead of us today. Uh, today's guest is skilled in communications and analytics. She is ProSci certified with change management communications and is currently the change enablement manager at Stanley Black & Decker. Please welcome to the show, Marquel Hunter. Hello, Marquel. Thank you. I'm really excited to have you today. And you're the second guest that we have uh, hosted from Stanley Black & Decker. So really excited to, uh, to get some other perspective from you. Um, Big shoes to follow um, and Zach shoes, but I do have a slightly different perspective than he does. And, and listen, that's why we, we do invite more than one professional from many of the, the companies that, you know, we think might be a, a good fit for this, because I think it's, it's n number one, it's not about your company. The show is really about you and, and the wisdom that you've uh, learned and earned, you know, throughout your professional career. Um, but also even inside the same organization, I think many people can have, you know, different roles and obviously different perspectives on things. So I'm really looking forward to hearing that with you. So let's let's start off as we always do and ask you what you think is the biggest challenge facing the deskless workforce today. Yeah, so you feel, I feel like I have been praying for this all week and I still up till 5 a.m. was thinking about what my answer was going to be. I thought it would be we talk communications or maybe technology, but I think um, I'm going to say for now, okay, I, I feel like I, a drum roll is warranted here. Can I we make, edit in a drum I roll? might take this back later, Justin. Um, but <laughs> what I settled on saying is I think the biggest issue is representation. Hmm. Um, okay. And I don't know if that requires an explanation or not. It does. But I, yeah, okay, I'd love for you so, to talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, um, I've I've had the honor and um, the privilege to work for Fortune 500 companies throughout my career. I'm always amazed at how often our frontline workers, the people that are, you know, creating our products, selling our services, the first line of defense, the last line of defense for our customers are an afterthought in planning technology and change activities. And I think that a lot of that can be changed with having representation of frontline workers at the table when we are making, I support HR right now, when we are making those HR decisions, when we're making those technology decisions, sometimes we roll them out to an entire organization and last minute we're like, oh wait, we need to figure out how we're going to get this to employees and our plants that don't, that can't use their phones. We rolled out this impressive mobile app, but most of our employees can't use their phone on the shop floor or they can't have their phone on the desk in the call center. They can only do it on their personal time and they're hourly workers, so how does that work? So I feel like a lot of the times it's an afterthought from corporate instead of a first thought where it should be. I think that's an amazing point that you raise. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any hunches for, for why that is. Yeah, I think it's hard to bring them to the table. <laughs> I think, um, you know, if you're in the planet and you have goals to make certain amount of objects or complete certain amount of tasks, it's hard to pull you off the floor to get your feedback on the new HR system or rolling out. If you're in the call center, you have to worry about your handle time or your after call work or all the many things that you're focused on. It's hard for us to even get you off the phone for training because, right, you keep the company running. You are everything that we need is coming through that front line, right? That's why we were we were taught calling them essential workers at the beginning of the pandemic. And we were focusing on the fact that, hey, these people have always been here and we didn't give them enough credit for the work that they are doing. So it's hard to take you away from your job when you're so crucial to your job. 
especially in times where we're going through what the great resignation and sometimes we don't have enough people to even accomplish the daily tasks. So it's a tall order to ask for someone to be so crucial to how a company is run to take time off and give us their thoughts and opinions on things that impact them. So what you've said is essentially the reason that we started this podcast. This is exactly what uh, we we agree completely with what you've just said. Um, we had I don't know that I've thought of it the way that you described it in terms of they have a lack of representation, but that is exactly what we were aiming for with Frontline Innovators was to help raise the awareness mm -hmm. of their needs and to help provide some perspective for everybody that is involved with building and, and deploying technology solutions to the men and women on the front lines and not just technology, but we've got a little bit of a bent here on this, on the show about, you know, talking about digital transformation initiatives, but I, I think you're spot on that they have been underrepresented. They don't always get a seat at the table on the planning phases. And I think part of what puts them back on their heels a little bit is that, you know, we may have been working on this project in corporate for two years and been involved in a lot of planning and vendor selection and device selection and, you know, all the other things that are going on. And then all of a sudden, two weeks before this thing's going to get deployed, it's like, hey, by the way, <laughs> we're rolling out, you know, new technology. And so the the purpose of this show, and I can't wait to talk this through with you more, is to really raise the awareness of that so that we can look at how can we be including them earlier in the process and in, in hopefully the discovery and design phases of solutions. Uh, all with the mindset that, you know, the, the better prepared they can be, the more likely they are to adopt the technology and ultimately the more successful they can be and everybody else can be in the organization. Right. And I don't think I have to tell you, like, adoption is key. So we roll out something to for a certain reason to impact bottom line, to improve morale, to improve the focus of, you know, the employees and they don't adopt it. We've then wasted time and effort, as you said, sometimes years to roll out a solution that's not being widely used. And I think that's a key reason why I am focused on change management now, because I, I've seen from the technology aspect and from the communications aspect, us put a lot of thought and effort into things and they just don't hit, they don't resonate with anyone, so. Yeah. That's, that's really near and dear to my heart. That, that's what's been frustrating over the years is seeing companies invest millions or tens of millions of dollars in technology and then to learn later that they weren't getting the adoption that they expected for, for a variety of reasons. And as I think back on all the projects I've been involved with, I think there are so many cases. Sometimes it was done very, very well. And, and I think change management and communication were handled well, even if they didn't use those terms to describe it. You know, change mm -hmm. management isn't has become a more popular phrasing, but sometimes people even before change management was as, um, you know, that, that term was used as regularly as it is today. Even before that, people were, um, you know, employing what we would now call change management strategies. They might just not have described them that way, right? And so, um, but it's interesting to look back on those projects and see when adoption wasn't what everyone had hoped for, what were some of the, the things that happened earlier on in that project that might have, you know, led to better adoption had it been done differently. So, so let's talk about your background. How did you tell us a little bit about your career journey and, and what are some of the milestones that have led you to uh, becoming the professional that you are today? Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. Like, I think we've always been doing some level of change management in our lives. We just might not have had the proper term for it. So I actually um, started in communications and we would take different, like an hour training here, maybe a half day training there to learn how to speak change language. And um, it really called to me because I have a pretty diverse skill set. I'm very creative. I can build websites and I do a little bit of graphic design, but I also like um, the technical aspect of change. I liked the writing aspect. I came, like I said, through communications and that's kind of my passion and just being able to, you know, translate highly technical terms into common speak is something that I love to do, but I never wanted to be in the box of just writing all day, or I never wanted to be in the box of just coding all day. And so in change management, I do a little bit of everything. And so once I discovered it and once I was able to put a name on it. I have not turned back. 
I think um, my favorite part of like telling people what I do about my job is like, they're like, wait, so what is that called? You do all of that? Yeah, we do a little learning and development. We do, um, tr we do training, we do communications and writing materials. We hold focus groups. So it's just such a diverse skill set. And to me, that's what I love the most about it. No one day is the same. Everything is different. I've been working on the same project here at um, Stanley Black and Decker since I arrived, but it's still, it's still a different day every single day. And as I continue to build relationships, another key part of change management that I love, you're stretching cross-functionally, right? I might be meeting with HRIS this morning and in the afternoon I'm meeting with finance or whatever the case may be. So I love the diversity of change management. I love the fact that it's a creative um, outlet for me, but also I can use my technical skill sets. We do a lot of resource site building where we're building out SharePoints and that's something that I really love to do as well. So I, I, that's kind of what brought me to change. And um, I, like I said, I don't see myself turning away from it. Right now I'm working in a very segmented part of change where I support HR. And so it's more change in communications. I don't do as much learning and development as I have done in previous roles. And um, we have a separate learning and development team here who is really well led and they're like, hey, give us some of your ideas. We partner together all the time. We report to the same manager. And so I still can dip my toe in it a little bit and make sure I'm scratching that itch as well. Well, that's something that I really wanted to talk to you about today, knowing your background and, and having in previous roles been involved in the, the learning and development side of things as well. Help me understand where you would kind of draw the line between pure communications versus training content, because it seems to me that there's likely some overlap. And I, I feel like uh, on this podcast, we've begun to use them uh, not interchangeably, but uh, without a clear delineation between the two. And I'd like to get your take on that. I think it just depends on what your employer defines it as, because right now, like I said, that there's a clear um, cut line of what that is. We still partner and work together often. Your employer is really who determines what the division of comms and learning and development is. So in my role, um, as I mentioned now, I partner with learning and development when I need to on projects. They have a very clear and defined role of what is learning and development, but we do have to work together because something on the comms plan may relate to learning and development and vice versa, but I very much am, um, and comms in this role, I focus on external, well, it's still internal, but um, comms that are for the general public and within the organization, such as we're doing blogs, we're making videos with executive sponsors to be able to sell whatever our concept is, explain the what's in it for me on our projects. We're creating infographics. That is kind of my wheelhouse and in learning and development they create infographics too their cre their infographics are focused on training and hey we're rolling out this new product here's what you need to know to um, use the product successfully whereas my infographics are more high level and it's like this is what's in it for you here's the date the time the creation of the change here's what's changing for you. And here's what you need to know around the change. Whereas they're like, hey, here's a day in the life of how your change will be a little bit different. And like I said, there's a lot of cross partnering on that. Um, we meet weekly in multiple working sessions to make it happen because it could, it should be seamless. But previous to this um, in my role, I did it all. Like my team, my change management team, we were considered change in communication um, managers and we plan all the training. So what we used to do was roll out um, change for techno technological changes. And so anytime the company decided, hey, this is, we need to switch from Skype to Teams and Zoom, that's what we did. Or within a smaller, um, in a smaller setting, hey, finance needs to change management because they're using a new finance 
software. So in that role, um, even though it was still very widespread, we kind of did everything. We would partner with engineers to deliver trainings. We would work with um, the different business groups to figure out what their exact needs were. And we did everything from the communications to the learning and development. And here, um, it's a, the change team is very, very robust. And so we can't, we can't support it all. So there is a clear defined line of what that looks like for us. Yeah. So you, you think um, with your background in communications, do, do you feel like that influences how you would go about building and recommending the training content? Yes, because I think everything should be creative and fun and innovative. And so mm -hmm. I think someone asked me in a meeting a couple of weeks ago, do you think we should gamify this? And I'm like, I think we should gamify everything because in communications, we're so used to um, so many, so many competing materials coming in, right? Like, are you going to read my blog on the company blog? Or are you going to just read your emails when you have five minutes? Like, we had to find creative ways to pull our viewers in and make sure that they were getting the message, no matter what that message may have been. And so when it comes to even, even my change management, but especially when I have insights into learning and development, like I am always looking for creative ways to get those ideas across, create more ways to make meetings more engaging. Um, as part of comms, we would support town halls and, and different focus groups and things like that. And so always in those, I was always trying to find another way to like, hey, how can we get the crowd involved? How can we make this more engaging? How can we get people to show up? Because you, you always have competing priorities. Yeah. You know, one of the things that it was coming to my mind as you were describing all the different communication mediums and, and stuff like that is that your audience may have, uh, will have, people that absorb things in different ways at different times, right? And may prefer different forms of media. So uh, what just occurred to me, and maybe I sh this should have occurred to me sooner, <laughs> is that, you know, you may have some folks that you can publish something in a blog post and they'll take the time to read a 500 word blog post and they'll absorb a lot of that. And that's a good format for that. Others may never go to that source, even if you tell them about it 12 times. And so for somebody else, a quick video snippet or, you know, some other email or whatever other format might be more appropriate for them. So do you find yourselves like, as you're looking at that communication plan, do you look at hitting the same people with different forms of, of media, or are you doing more precision where you're saying, well, this audience is going to get a blog post and this audience is going to get an email or a video. How do you guys handle that? Yeah, I think it, de it depends on the project because sometimes you're just throwing stuff at the wall and see what yeah. sticks, right? Yeah. Especially when it comes to frontline workers, because there are so many different varieties of frontline workers. Yeah. And um, in a company of this size, you you can't reach everybody with everything. And so a lot of times we're, we're just trying to get something to resonate. We're trying to get something to land. But then there are strategic smaller changes um, or change strategies where we're like, okay, we're directly taking this to our frontline workers. We're talking about specifically the digital signage in plants. I'm not going to see that if I work from home. I'm not going to see that if I work from an office. That is strategic to hit our plant workers, right? Or if we're talking um, frontline, you know, as I mentioned in the call center, hey, when they load their computer, can we, you know, have a pop up that says, we're instituting this technology change in five days and do a little countdown. So I think it's a little mixture of both and it definitely depends on the project that you're on. But I, I think that, <laughs> I think you said it really well, everything is different. So, right, we have so many different personas, even within, if we're just talking frontline shop workers, how many different personas are there? We have managers there. We have uh, people leaders who ha have managers that report to them. We have managers that just have employees report to them. We have employees. We have people that fit into multiple personas. So, you know, when I talk about what's changing for you as an employee, and then I pivot to talk about what's changing for you as a manager, managers are employees too. So they care about both aspects of it. So I think that, um, I think we're still figuring it out completely, but I'm, I'm all for mixing and matching the two strategies. 
it's actually a really important thing you just mentioned, which is, and, and I'm probably the guiltiest of them all in terms of how I, maybe I've messaged this a few times as if frontline workers all fit into the same persona. And, and I, I'll, I'll make an excuse for myself in saying that the, the reason I probably am making that generalization a lot of times is because I'm contrasting the profile of the men and women on the front lines versus the men and women who are sitting in, you know, more traditional knowledge worker roles, you know, in a cubicle or, or in a desk. But you're absolutely correct that underneath that larger umbrella of frontline worker persona, uh, there is there is many more than just one, right? And um, you, you also mentioned something I think that is really important is about the frontline leadership. One of the things that I think is somewhat unique to the men and women on the front lines and the traditional roles in manufacturing and delivery and field service and some of the other things that we would talk about on the show is that they do have the responsibility of being both a manager and many times they're also filling in, especially right now with this change in the workforce that we've had. We're hearing examples every single day where the managers don't really have t- time to be a manager because they're filling in and they're they're running a route or they're actually taking work orders or they're doing things on the manufacturing line because they don't have enough people to do the job. And so that's adding a burden. And I, I love that you said managers or employees too, right? They, in many cases, are having to fill both of those roles. Yeah, and, and a key point that you said there, we, we talk about the different personas let's throw a global company in the mix, right? Um, I, yeah. I'm often flexing my schedule to meet, you know, 9 p.m. to meet at 9 a.m. In, in Asia time. So we right. throw in the different personas and I talk with other colleagues um, across HR. Some of them support plants where people have handwritten resumes still. When people just, they hold open sessions where people come in and apply off the street or their friends refer them and say, hey, we're hiring today, come in and apply. Whereas, you know, in the US, it's not typically done that way. You typically go in and apply online. And so as change managers, I love the reach and the experience of getting to know the little intricacies. I've been here um, over a year now and I still don't know all the little intricacies because it's a global company and every country does things a little bit different. They have different rules and regulations that apply and they have different cultures um, that you have to take into account. So whereas we might do everything electronically, it may be required to still do a handwritten signature in some countries. And so I think that also makes it a lot more difficult to, you know, going back to when I said, you know, representation matters. It's important to have a seat at the table, but we can't give everyone a seat at the table, right? Because it gets convoluted and they have jobs to do. But I think that we can do better in general about making sure that we are considering them, that we're using them um, in focus groups and getting their opinion where we can. We're doing plant visits when we can, we're talking to those people, we're talking to the people that were closest with their people, the HR fill reps and um, sales reps and people of those nature who go from plant to plant and may have the time to sit down and talk with us. So they do have a seat at the table. They're not just a guest, it's not just a guest chair that we're pulling right. up, that they're always at the forefront of our mind. You just made me realize that there's a term that we use that we hear mentioned and written about that's kind of an oxymoron. It's like global standardization. When I think about at the times I've been around large multinational companies and there are always major IT initiatives that seek to standardize things globally. Yet if we think about the reality of being global, it means that there are different cultures, there are different norms in every place that we operate. And so I, you tend to hear about these strategic initiatives internally, which is that we're going to roll out an ERP, you know, globally, and we're going to try to standardize as many processes as we can and all that kind of stuff. And then when it actually starts getting underway, all these nuances are discovered in each one of the locales about the way that they operate in that particular, you know, domain. And so it, it's, it's almost like going into it. We have expectations that are not realistic. Like the idea of trying to standardize globally is a flawed <laughs> mission right out of the gate. It's right? US center. It's very US centric. Term, that's, I think. that's that's interesting that you point that out. And, and you're absolutely right. As I think about it, it's been mostly US companies that are striving 
to have some, you know, level of standardization throughout the rest of the globe. But then when you actually get feet on the ground in those various countries, you realize that, like you said today, they may still be doing things on paper. They may have, uh, you know, we, we learned in one case that field service technicians were actually running calls on bicycles in certain cities, you know? So like, we, we couldn't even fathom that here in the United States. Like everybody would have a, a white van with their company logo on the outside, but that in some countries in this one operation we were dealing with, their field service techs had like tool bags on their bicycles and they would drive a bicycle to the, to the next location. So you think about implementing technology between those two scenarios, it's like, yeah, it's probably gonna warrant a little bit of a different, you know, communication training plan and, and the adoption may be a little bit different in each of those areas. It does. And that, um... That is like one of my favorite parts about being a change manager and my favorite tool that I I think is not as utilized as often as we think, the change network. So I think that is the best tool you have to you to make sure that you're getting representation across business units or make sure we get representation across countries and um, that we can make sure that anything that we need that they have an opinion on it right so for example we have a project global project we have a change network of 360 people wow it is my favorite absolute favorite thing to do making meetings for them and sharing the content with them so that they can turn it back to their workers and they are the ones that give me the feedback sometimes that feedback is brutal like hey what you're trying to do is definitely not going to work here just not going to work here we can't do it that way we have laws that tell us we can't do it that way the the change impact is too big on our um, floor workers. They're so used to us doing all the work for them. Now you're asking them to, to have some empowerment and do it themselves and you want them to do it by X amount of time. It's too much of a change, but um, they're really good for giving us that feedback, giving us the perspective, helping us measure the change, see what the change impacts are. They do everything from verify our translations from external vendors. I can't tell you if something is written properly in check. I, I'm just assuming that the vendor is right. And so, you know, and there's, there's colloquialisms involved, there's slang involved that we're using terms that resonate. Obviously I'm from the US, I write um, in that style. And so maybe I'm using terms that are too jargony and they don't translate as well. Like I, yeah. I know that one of the concepts here that we had a problem with, and it's such a small thing, but it was like a big deal. Like we talk about the difference between um, a people experience and an employee experience, right? And we were very thoughtful and strategic about saying people experience because we want this experience to involve people that are coming to work for us. They're not employees yet. Or people that previously worked for us, whether they moved on or they've retired or whatever the case may be. So we were very strategic about the term people experience and looking at different infographics and how they were translated, it was like, it did not, it was not an easy term to explain. There are sometimes people, they translated it right back to employee experience because that's what they thought we were trying to say. And so like those little nuances, our change network is the one that is like, hey, by the way, this is crazy. You need to fix this. <laughs> it doesn't make sense at all, yeah. at least in our language, right? That's, yeah. yeah, that's fascinating. So let me go back to something you said here, the 360 people in the change network. I'm always fascinated by this with companies that are as large as yours. Mm -hmm. Like what's the right sample size? You know, when we're thinking about affecting change in a massive scale, especially a multinational organization, how do you ensure that you're choosing the right sample size to incorporate into your change network and, and to be soliciting feedback from and stuff? So to hear you talk about 360 people, that's, that's bigger than many companies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just in your change network. So how did you come up on 360 people? Was it 10 people from each country you're operating in? Or like, how did you come up with that plan? I wish it was that simple. So let me back up and say that I ran a change network before I came to SVD and worked with the change management team. And it was very different. It was year round, we held a change network. As we ramped up for certain projects, we may have changed the composition. We may have asked for additional volunteers. Um, this one is, is for an HR global initiative for over 50,000 employees. So when you look at 50,000 employees, 360 people is not a lot. However, from a management perspective, it is a lot of people. Yeah. Um, 
So we have different levels of involvement in the change network. We have what we call our regional leads and they are the, kind of the top, they are director and above, they are people leaders. And we kind of expect them to manage the other people within the change network. We meet with them more often, we have a bigger um, request from them, we have a bigger workload because as we talked about, sometimes the, the frontline and essential workers that we have, they don't have time to show up to six meetings in a month, right? So, but these, we're expecting a little bit heavier lift from our regional leads. And then we have our change champions who are the bulk of our change network. Um, they don't have the requirement to be a people leader. We ask that they cover a breadth of different countries. Um, there was a formula involved that I had nothing to do with. I think our consulting mm -hmm. company did that where they basically were like, here's where you have the most employees, here's where you need the most representation because um, this company is highly matrix. We have different individual um, business units who operate like small miniature companies within the company. And so we needed to make sure that we are getting um, engineered fastening represented, security represented. Um, you know, so they they did a formula to make sure that we had at least a certain amount of recommendations to match the amount of people in the country. And so we made sure that it spans different countries, um, it spans different business units, and that is not easy to manage because, like I said, I, I do a lot of time flexing of my schedule to make sure yeah. that we're able to meet with people across different time zones. Not every time the person that you want that person that you want in that sponsor role, they don't always speak English. I only speak English. Um, right. And it's expensive to have translators on every call. So, so we have to take that into consideration. And so there's a lot of factors that played into it. Um, I think, and then we have a final layer, which is a few less people, but they're more like the people that have the lighter lift, but they're still involved in the change process. So we're, we call them ambassadors and we don't meet with them as often. We meet with them quarterly and we ask that our regional leads follow up with them monthly. And they, we ask them to embed change where they already are, right? So if you're already going to attend a town hall as the finance uh, lead for your business unit, can you say a few words about our project while you're in there and tell them right. it's coming when the deadline is? If you're already hosting team meetings or attending team meetings, can you update the 15 other people in your team so they know what's going on? So this isn't a surprise for them when we roll out this new change. So um, that's a lot of information to say that yeah. there is no one size fit all. Um, when I worked in technology, what I wanted from a change, um, change network member was the first adopters, you know, the, the innovators, the key thinkers, the people that were like, yeah. Ooh, I technology, let me put my hands on it. Um, but for HR initiative, I want a little bit more of, it's nice to have those first adopters because we still have technology and in every part of the process, but I would I want a little bit more empathy for you to understand what other people deal with, what other how this change is going to impact people outside of specifically your role, people that you support as a business partner, whether it's HR or finance or technology or whatever the case may be. I would like for you to have a little more empathy and a little more thought behind it. So I think it's it's a Great tool if you use it right. I, I hope that I'm using it right, but it's also one of my favorite things to do. Yeah. Is there any particular advice you would give to somebody when when thinking about how to solicit and organize and manage uh, a change network? Anything that comes to mind that yeah, is a lesson learned first, for you? My first advice is to accept volunteers first, right? They are typically the people that are more... Um, focus on the project. They have more loyalty to the project because they give their own time. We can't always do that. You didn't get 360 volunteers. I guarantee you there are right. a lot of people that were volunteered is the term that I like to use. <laughs> yeah. um, but I also have learned that we ro when we roll it out and people see what we're doing, that we get more volunteers there. Like when yeah. people see what we're doing and they get the recognition um, for doing that, we get more volunteers there. And then the other key piece that I mentioned was recognition. I think that we expect a lot people to take on a lot and um, change is not easy. No one likes it. Even us as change managers, sometimes we're kind of resistant to change 
the ambiguity or like the liminal state that you're in of like, oh, what's going to happen? I don't have all the information is confusing for people. And so when people do show up for you and they're good change agents and they're modeling, modeling the behavior that you want in a change network, I think you recognize them for it. Yeah. I tend to be um, very open to change and adaptable. In fact, I think whatever weird way my brain is wired, I actually thrive on uh, the inconsistency and, and unpredictability. But it actually causes me personally to have a blind spot. And that blind spot is that I, I have to recognize that there are probably more people not like me than like me. Mm-hmm. Meaning that, it, you know, you just talked about the ambiguity and the unknown that's that's coming around the corner. And I've had to train myself to realize that others are really petrified about some of that change, like genuine, real anxiety about the unknown. And so since it's not an emotion that really comes to me very often, I've really had to like think about it intellectually and kind of force myself to to recognize that. But I think, and I've learned this from, from professionals like you of really having to think about the anxieties that could be triggered by this change and that the change is going to be uncomfortable. And even I, even though I may be mentally willing to adopt the change, it doesn't mean that it's not uncomfortable for me to change my habits and all of that other stuff, right? So I do recognize that part of it. But the better we can do of communicating to those men and women up front and to take out some of that ambiguity and to take out some of that unknown. I mean, it's not, I know it's one of these things that every time we say it, it sounds so freaking obvious to talk about it here on a podcast, but when you're dealing with a big organization and there are deadlines and there's never enough budget, there's never enough people. Uh, some of these things are easier said than done, right? I can see the communication plan slipping in terms of priority, but when you really think about it out loud, like we're doing here on the show, it's like, you can't let that communication, that awareness phase, you can't let it drop off or drop lower on the priority list because everything else you do after that is going to be less effective because of all those emotional issues that we just talked about. It's true. And I think that the ambiguity, I think you're the first person that I ever heard say, like, I like that. It's kind of mm. to even to think about it to me, and this is what I do every day, like the chaos of it, not a fan, but I have met people that uh, they're like, hey, I love change in my personal life. I don't want it when I come here to work. Like, I, yeah. you know, because that change can lead to reduction of workforce. It could lead to reduction on either side, right? You have, um, you're not sure what that means for you and your job. So you start looking for other jobs. You don't know yes. that uh, there's going to be layoffs or not. And then, you know, at, coming from a corporate standpoint, we, are, we have to be hesitant with what we communicate. And so it does create a level of ambiguity. And I think the, the ambiguity is what makes the change so scary because we know change is coming. It's always coming. Um, that's why change fatigue is a thing. Corporations do not grow and get to where they are as successful corporations without change. There's always 50 different change priorities going on. They're all competing priorities. They're all priority priorities. Like <laughs> if, if everything is everything is a 10 level importance yeah. and nothing yeah. is a 10 level importance. But that's what we deal with in our workforce today. And so when people, you know, they hear especially some of the larger changes that we deal with from an HR support perspective, the first thing they think of is, you know, am I going to lose my job? And then sometimes we're not communicating until three months later, and then we have to wait for that communication to trickle down. That could be the difference in us losing hundreds of jobs or not losing hundreds of jobs. And Literally. so it, it's, it's yeah. very key. It's very important. Yeah. I, I, in that spot on and, and, you know, keep in mind that, you know, when I say that I'm adaptable to change, I've been fortunate that I've been in roles where I didn't feel like this change was likely to affect my livelihood, right? And I, I think this is something we have to be aware of when we're rolling out technology to the men and women on the front lines, there's a tendency for us to talk a lot about efficiency and all the improvements to the business that it, that is going to create. And of course, those are legitimate things that we need to be striving for. But to the point I think you're making is that on the receiving end of that comment, it's like, oh, are you going to efficiency me out of a job, right? Mm-hmm. 
And, and I've seen it firsthand. I've been out in various locations where people feel very threatened by the technology that we're trying to roll out. And the, my plea to the men and women who are responsible for building out these projects, I've been in the conference rooms with those folks as we're designing these solutions. And I can't think of a single example where the goal of that project was to reduce headcount. There's typically a goal to increase the output from the same headcount, right? So there's still maybe things for people to be nervous about, right? We are trying to make the business more efficient, look for continuous improvement opportunities. But the, my, my plea is we need to do a better job of communicating to those folks that will be affected to let them know that this isn't designed. It's designed to work with them, not is a replacement for them in many cases. Now, I, I guess as I'm saying that, I guess there could be projects that are designed to reduce headcount. So I, I guess then it's probably a, a bit of a slippery slope in how you handle that communication. Um, but we can't stick in our head in the sand and pretending like it's not an issue. It's ridiculous. The, the employees are feeling these things. They're thinking the worst case scenario in most cases. Mm -hmm. So we owe it to them and we owe it to ourselves for the success of the project to be more proactive on that. It's true. It's, I think it's human nature to go with the worst case scenario. Yeah. And, and you're right. Like, you know, it may affect if you're putting your kid through college, it may yes. in, impact your lifelong decision making. Can you retire this year? Do you have to yeah. wait 10 years out? And unfortunately, I have been on the side of changes where they have led to a reduction in workforce. And it's never easy and it's never personal. And I right. think, especially in those situations, it's sometimes you start at the change of project and it does not seem that it's going to be that way but then at the end of the day companies are about making money and mm -hmm. so when the bottom line is impacted there is sometimes that reduction of workforce so i think yeah. it is a valid concern however i think digging your heels in and and like hey I don't want this change is never going to stop that from happening. I, I think I, uh, I texted an old boss uh, a couple of days ago and I said, what's a nice way to tell someone that they need to get on this train because it's going to go off without them. I haven't still found a nice way to say it, but that's what we do, right? Like um, rather you love the change, rather it has job impacts or not, rather you are, assuming to adopt the change rather you're like hey I want more time at the end of the day you you can't avoid it change is constant that's the yeah. one thing that all of the companies that you've had on this podcast will tell you Completely. change is always happening and so I think the best thing that we can do and this is speaking as an employee and not a change manager is to embrace change when it happens volunteer for those change networks, volunteer right. for those focus groups, share your opinions, and then get ready, embrace yourself for the change as whatever it may come and in whatever form that it may come, because it's not going to stop it from coming, right. but you can impact how it looks for you, right? I can impact how that change looks for me and my business group in the U.S. I can impact how that looks for my business group in Asia, I can make sure that this isn't a U.S. centric change, that they are taking my local customs and the, the way we do business into play, or I cannot. And so I think that's really key as an employee to realize that, hey, it's going to come. Unfortunately, you can cringe every time you see my name pop up in your inbox, or <laughs> you can work with me so that yeah. we can make the change successful. Yeah. I don't think your statement of uh, get on the train or don't, but uh, is, is, you know, that offensive. I, I think it might be, I don't know. It, it sounds a little tough love when I hear you say it, but exactly. you know, it's at some point it's like that, that might be the, the choice of words, which is, you know, we're, this thing's happening. Right. And that is part of the, the challenge we have to overcome is, is to help inform without necessarily driving people away. I had one business leader tell me that every time they've rolled out a new version of their technology for their field force, this was in a delivery organization that they were going to have some attrition just because they were being given a new handheld. Like some people were just going to quit just because mm -hmm. of the handheld. And it kind of made me chuckle as I thought about it after the fact, cause I'm like, well, then now they're going to go get another job at some other company and it's going to be different software. They're going to have to learn something new anyway, but they've just, you know, they were frustrated by the number of times that they've been asked to change. And it was like, okay, this is it. I'm leaving. Um, 
All right, we're, we're running out of time here. I yeah. said that we're uh, trying to shorten the length of the show. I haven't really been able to do that successfully, so <laughs> shame on me. I'm but sorry I haven't helped either. No, it's been good. I, I don't want to cut you short. I'm enjoying the discussion. So uh, I do want to kind of wrap up, though. I'm, I'm curious to get a sense for if there are any tools that you use, other pieces of software or technology or methods that you use uh, not the ones that you're actually implementing, but tools that you use for the sake of implementing. So are you doing anything for communication, for training, for change management that maybe is a little bit out of the ordinary that our audience might find interesting? Um, as I mentioned, I am a big fan of thinking outside the box when it comes mm -hmm. to communication and learning. And so I do a lot of gamification, a lot of engaging um, type of content so like for our change networks we start every meeting with music you can do that in zoom super easy we incorporate videos and guest speakers when we can because um change fatigue meeting fatigue i know that you joked about it with zach that you're like i'm on a zoom meeting and i don't have fatigue but there are days when from 9 a.m to 9 p.m all i am is on zoom yeah. meetings and i have fatigue so i get it <laughs> so my suggestion is, you know, we've, we've gotten really fun with even we partner a lot with um, hum, human resource information system and jumping in there and saying like, hey, guys, this testing is so fun. It's, can we, you know, make it more engaging? <laughs> and so my suggestion for those is, who are listening, when she said fun, if you're not seeing the video, when she yeah. said fun, she was smiling, but nodding her head left and right as if that was very sarcastic. I just want to make sure that that came through. <laughs> yeah. Plot twist. I did not mean that it was fun. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I went from working with um, engineers to working with more like the information system and they have a very similar mentality of hey we're rolling out this technology use it um and that's not how people generally work so yeah. my suggestion is if you're really looking to like spice up your communication you you are moving from a standard email to maybe an infographic if you're moving from you know, uh, just having a town hall to maybe an interactive meeting where you're going in deep how and you're using, you know, um, an illustrated meeting or whatever the case may be. Google gamification, Google engaging meeting content. It's the smallest things that take your meeting from, oh, I have to attend this meeting. I have to attend this town hall. I have to attend this, you know, learning session to, Hey, she's she plays Whitney Houston right before the meeting. Like, okay, yeah. I'm kind of into this. I'm trying to see what this is about and what they have to say. And I think we always talk about tools and budget, but there's so many great tools out there that I use that are included within our additional software. So rather you're using SurveyMonkey or Kahoot, rather you're using Miro software to do a whiteboard, whatever the case may be investigate what your company has, Google some of the options that are out there. There are so many. Um, start your meeting off with an icebreaker question. That's one of the things you can Google. Uh, top 200 icebreakers, you'll find things. And start your meeting with what is your favorite dish? Um, with a global audience, I learned so much. It is so fun to read the different items and, and just get a different perspective and treat people like they are humans as opposed to, you know, um, something that you're checking off your to-do list. I think it's key. I love that. I think that's a great place for us to, to wrap this up. Thank you so very much for taking the time today. It's been a fantastic conversation, Mark. Well, I really uh, appreciate you getting your time. perspective on this. And um, it was good to have you back to back with Zach uh, from, from a couple of weeks ago. So uh, yeah, I feel like I know it, you guys both work for the same company, but this was a completely different conversation about different topics. And I'm really glad we got the choice to or got the chance to uh, visit with both of you. So thank you for taking that time. No problem. And I will say Zach is probably the one that will tell people to get on the train and get off. It's a, I have a different communication approach, but I enjoyed listening to your podcast with him. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the opportunity. Excellent. Well, we're going to wrap it up there. And I hope the audience has found this conversation as wonderful as I have. 
Uh, if so, please share and rate the podcast. As we say every week, five-star ratings help ensure that it gets promoted to other professionals like you that are innovating on the front lines. And we are starting to see a real pickup in the number of downloads in the podcast and the views on YouTube. So thank you all for the support. Uh, remember, this podcast is sponsored by Skillful, the mobile digital adoption platform for deskless and frontline workers. Visit the website at skyllful.com. And if you know somebody else who's out there innovating on the front lines, we'd love to hear about it. Please reach out to me on LinkedIn and share their story. We'd love to have them on another episode of Frontline Innovators. Mark Wall, thanks for your time today. Thank you.